Um, I'm going to ask everyone to sort of introduce themselves, and then I'll sort of do my own little introduction, if you will. So, Joshua? Uh, hi, I'm Josh Barry. Um, I work at ABC. Um, I develop all the one hours there. Uh, I'm actually in the drama department, but that's sort of a misnomer. We, you know, develop dramas and comedies, but anything that's uh, one hour. Um, <laughs> I've been there for four years, um, and before that, uh, I guess I've been a vice president at ABC for three years. Before that, I was uh, an exec at Touchstone for the four years before that. Um, does that sound good enough? That sounds good. And jo Josh has been involved in numerous hits um, that you watch, including Desperate Housewives, Lost, Grey's Anatomy, a bunch of new shows coming out. So Many hits. Um, Lucia Cotone, I am uh, Vice President of Development at Lifetime Television. Um, I oversee uh, the development slate for one-hour dramas and possibly comedies. We're not sure quite yet. <laughs> and, um, and at the same time, I also do some shows in current programming. Previously to Lifetime, I was at Nets, NBC Universal, at the studio overseeing cable over there. So I had the privilege to work on Monk and um, develop Eureka in plain sight and a couple other shows. And before that, I was out of the business for about four and a half years. <laughs> and before that, I was an executive at UPN, and I was at studios before that. So that is my New life. New York life. changed your life. That's in, what you, uh, in New York changed yeah. my life. We'll tell that story later on. <laughs> Uh, I'm Kate Jurgens. I'm uh, head of programming at ABC Family, which is a cable channel owned by Walt Disney. Before that, I was at the WB, and before that, NBC. So I've walked both sides of the cable broadcast fence. Uh, I'm Steve Weisel. I am currently at the CW Network, and I'm in comedy development. Um, before that, I was at UPN for six and a half years. Uh, I'm Lisa Harrison. I'm an agent in the television lit and packaging department at Endeavor. Um, before that, I was an executive at 20th Century Fox Television, primarily in comedy. And before that, I had a, an amazing job um, scouting for actors, writers, and directors in comedy for all the feature and TV divisions at Fox. Um, so uh, I have I've first. done many different things. That was the world's best job. That was mm -hmm. the world's best job. Uh, and I'm I'm Mark Corman. I was a criminal defense lawyer in Chicago for about eight years. Um, public defender. <laughs> I came out to L.A. Worked at uh, ABC as a lawyer. Uh, studio called Greenblatt Chandelari um, as a lawyer. Uh, then I worked for ATG, which was Michael Ovitz's television arm of AMG as a business affairs guy. And then I went to AMG as a manager, and then I've been at UTA for the last, I guess, five years. Um, I think the best place to start is probably to uh, start where the development process begins. And it's, it's different depending on network and cable. Um, they have different schedules. Uh, network is fairly cyclical. Um, the process typically starts at the same time each year, although that's changing. And I think that the cable outlets, um, doesn't seem to be as, <clears throat> excuse me, stringent. So um, as far as their time frame is concerned, so maybe one of you guys can start with how your development process starts and when it starts, how it starts, where the ideas come from you're looking for. So Kate, you want to start? Um, our process was basically at cable was basically developed around the broadcast schedule because because they pay a lot more money than we do because they buy a lot more than we do. We sort of have to bob and weave around them. So we basically develop exactly counterpoint to their schedule. We Look for we make pilots right after they announce their pickups. We, you know, pick up actors right after they're all cut loose from hundreds of pilots. We pick up, we buy scripts all year round, and we usually shoot two rounds of pilots a year. We usually shoot a round of pilots in the summer, and we shoot one in the, uh, the winter. And the good news for for the clients, um, it it means that there are opportunities all year round. I think before, prior to the pro proliferation of cable, you were sort of forced to live with the network schedules. And if you wanted to be a staff writer, for example. If you didn't get a job now, right now in May, more often than not, you are sort of waiting for someone to get fired on a network show, and that's changed substantially. It seems like there are staffing and development opportunities all the time now. Do you want to talk about how the development process starts at ABC and sure. so we can sort of mirror those two time frames? Yeah, we haven't been able to break away from the, the cycle at all, actually, at ABC. We're pretty, we're pretty locked in. <coughs> 
you know, it, it all sort of, it starts right now. It starts uh, at exactly this time of year. We all pretty much just got, well, a bunch of us just got back from New York where we announced our fall schedule. And immediately after that, we go into development. And that's when we sort of, you know, uh, we sit around trying to figure out what we want on the network next year, how the new shows will fit, in, will fit into our brand. We'll try and figure out um, which... Uh, you know, it's all just guesswork until you actually, <laughs> until something actually works or doesn't. But we still try. Um, and uh, then, um, um, or, you know, this, it's also the same time of year that all the writers, all the development people are sitting around trying to figure out, um, you know, what shows, to, what shows to bring us. And then uh, we really open our doors in, uh, in July, um, late July, pretty much after, after the 4th for pitches. And then, um, it's, it, and it's this... Incredible! It's this incredible time where you're hearing these amazing ideas, but by the end of the summer, you've heard you know, you know, upwards of 400 pitches or something like that, and your brain is mush. And uh, and uh, starts side starts a little bit later. Yeah, it's a little bit later. We're definitely not <laughs> thinking right now about <laughs> next year. I'll tell you at that. all. Um, at all. Um, it does start for us in July, um, and the process really. I guess the most important point for me is um, the concept phase. We get a lot of phone calls starting in July versus actual pitches. Um, people saying, what about this idea? What about this idea? And really trying to weed out what's right for us versus what may be a little bit um, right for another, another venue, another place. Um, so that for us, it, it is in July, but when we actually start hearing things is more August, September. Um, and, and buying buying scripts at that point too. A, a little bit kind of trickles in, but drama for the most part starts um, earlier than us. And Lisa, from your perspective as an agent, um, when you know that the networks on the drama side are opening in early July or the uh, comedy side a little bit later, what are you finding out for your clients? What are you saying to your clients? What are your clients saying to you about how the development process begins? Well, I think like Josh said, <clears throat> It's very hard to know what some what a network, what a buyer is really going to need in May, in July, because none of the new shows have launched, so we don't know what's going to stick, and therefore we don't know what the trends are or what needs there are going to be at a network. But what you try to ascertain is, A, just what's a great idea for a show, because once in a while you actually get something that will clutter bust and, and be a great idea regardless. Um, and then there's obvious holes that each place has that they've been trying to fill. For example, you know, ABC and the drama side for a long time has been trying to figure out how to do something that's more of a procedural. <clears throat> so this year they developed several things against that. So there are certain things that you know that a buyer may need. Um, but or, I think well, really I you work... procedural, but that still fits within Right, with your brand, brand exactly. Which is the hard part. So, um, yeah, not like a CSI, but, but something that allows you to have closed-ended cases and, and fits with the brand. And, um, but I think really what you look for and what you work with the clients on is something that um, they feel really passionately about that based on all of our experience, we know probably has a shot at actually being able to sustain as a TV show. Um, because we've all been through a lot of development, we kind of know where the pitfalls are or where the perceived, assumed pitfalls are in an idea. Um, so you really try to figure out something that is going to be viable in the marketplace that an artist is going to feel passionate about, and hopefully there's a lot of yeah, overlap. And, and similar, I mean, it, Endeavor and UTA actually yeah. work very similarly. Um, it's very much of a team approach. Um, and it, likewise, and together, it, it, often. We, 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 you know, that we, we packaged a lot of projects this year together. Um, um, I don't know how that happened, but it felt like if you look around to the actual network pickups this year um, on the drama side, because there wasn't a whole lot going on on the comedy side, unfortunately, there weren't that many pickups. But on the, on the, on the, on the drama side, um, there were just a lot of marriages of clients um, that seemed to work very well, especially for this man's network, yes. so um, it, that's, that's been terrific. And again, from my, my side, when the client comes in, I think it's all about passion and it's all about um, what you really, really want to do. But the thing you have to be careful about is if you hear an idea that you know was just developed or something that they've completely articulated they're not looking for, you have to be somewhat cognizant of that and make sure that the client is aware that the chances of selling that are probably not that great. 
Um, but that said, I think we were all talking before we started this morning. It's, it's there are diff different ways to phrase it, but it's the field of dreams. You know, like what are you looking for from the network? Well, well, we're looking for X, but yet as much as they're looking for X, you you kind of know when you hear what you're looking for. But there are certain things that um, you know that they're looking for. Josh's network for the last two years, Chris Brancato. <laughs> Josh, Josh's network for the last two years has been telling the world that they've been looking for time traveler's wife. Um, and as a result of that, a lot of people did time traveler's wife types of shows this, over the past couple of years in an attempt to sort of meet that bill. But when you guys on the cable side... And yet it ended up on NBC. And NBC, exactly. <laughs> That's true, but we, came, we pitched to you. I know. Um, uh, you guys didn't do that show. Um, from, the, from the cable side of things, um, do you guys look at the networks and sort of think, okay, well, that, the, the stuff that they're doing, that's not necessarily what we want to do. How, do. how does it work in comparison to coming up with what you're looking for? And uh, uh, Lifetime is interesting because obviously we sell women and we are a network about women, you know, 18 to 49. We are excluding, you know, the older demo that's there. And what's become fascinating is, you know, our sister company, or our stepsister company is ABC and the Disney, Ch and, uh, ABC family and the Disney Channel. So we're all sort of, you know, incestually Just in it. Stuff, right. But we do look a lot to the stuff that they're developing. You know, we track, we read the scripts once they're, you know, once they're, you know, the agents can send them to us and read them. Right now in the process of uh, the prime time schedule being set by all the networks, madly, furiously, a lot of people between the producers, the agent, and sometimes the studio are sending us the projects that did not get onto the schedules at the network to see if it's something we would put on the air. And even though, you know, we do, uh, we are in developing around, right now around 40, 40 plus projects, last year we shot um, six pilots. Out of those six, three made it to our schedule, which are premiering in the, right now in the summer. And, uh, and one of those, actually two of those scripts, one of them, uh, my friend, Josh, uh, uh, developed. And it was interesting because it did not fit into what they were doing, but it was a show that was perfect for where Lifetime was at the time and trying to rebrand and relaunch what Lifetime means to the audience and to, and to the executive team there, and that's Army Wives. And it's a show that's coming on the schedule June 3rd, and again, it's about you find the, you find the material, and with that particular material, if we can do something and it means something to us, then we, we will start doing the work you know, to get it there. Last year, we didn't even have a, a deal with ABC, with uh, ABC Studios, to be able to shoot the show with them. So we not only had to close deals with all the major studios in town, but at the same time with writers. And you know, through the help of the agencies, we were able to, in the community, in the entertainment community, get out there the new mandate and what we were doing. And so. a, another example of that is we, represent a, we represented a project called Side Order of Life that was um, written by a woman by the mar name of Margaret Nagel and executive produced by Jinx Cohn, the guys that did American Beauty. And that was initially developed for Josh. And, one, and uh, we uh, ultimately it did not get made, and we all thought that the project was worthy of, of living another day. Not that all projects aren't, but we actually thought that the script got a lot of buzz in the community, and, and we went to Lifetime with it, and it was a very difficult uh, negotiation, but ultimately it got made, and, and now it's on the air at Lifetime. But it, that does happen quite a bit where scripts um, start out at one place. It's a very difficult process. Scripts start out at one entity, at one outlet, and end up somewhere else. but. It's, it does absolutely does happen, and um, that being said, it feels to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the cable, sometimes writers sort of take the position, well, you know, we didn't get anywhere at the network. We made, we, we read, wrote, I wrote the script, or she or he wrote the script, but it didn't get made. Let's go to the cable outlets, and the one thing I think you have to be very aware of is the, the cable outlets typically are not in that business. They want their own product. They don't want sort of, quote, leftovers. It was coincidental that both of these projects were... Well, the third were, one well, is the also... Because State of Mind was NBC. Yeah. Well, the, thing, the thing also yeah. is that in it's not that we don't too. see it, yeah. at least in our team, and I mean, Kate, you, you can say how you guys work over there, but in our team, we don't see it as leftovers. We see a huge opportunity yeah. in something that's well, what we can develop. And I don't mean no, no, that, I'm not yeah. saying, but a, a lot of people do have that perception. Yeah. But you know what? At the end of the day, we don't care. It's about servicing <laughs> the talent in the town at the same time as being able to give something to the audience that, you know, we're there to deliver to the audience. Well, I think for so, us, I mean, it, speaking to your original question, Broadcast is by definition broad, and cable is very specific. Mm -hmm. And we are all very hyper aware of what our brand is. And it makes it very easy to narrow things down because it has to fit into a very specific range, which for cable, I mean, you're not going to sell the same thing to TBS that you're going right. to sell to Lucia that you're going to sell to me. It's very specific, which is which makes it simpler. 
I think uh, even though I missed the beginning, and I'm sorry about that, um, <laughs> it's good to step back for a second for an overview of the entire town, because I'm not sure that was discussed, which is to say that we have five major broadcast networks, Fox, NBC, ABC, CBS, and the CW, um, and then cable channels, of which there are nu numerous cable channels, and, and that is the universe uh, to go sell your script. Uh, um, I mean, we are also living in a, a sea change of a world right now where the computer and the television are one day going to be some sort of the same thing and where there are uh, distribution opportunities over the internet as well, as, as, as I'm sure some of you guys will speak to shortly. Um, for us as writers, the, the goal is how do we develop properties and projects that uh, those end users, the networks, be they cable or broadcast, um, want to put on their air. Um, secondarily, there are also, um, you know, when I came to town 1,550 years ago, uh, th there were 50 different studios that supplied the three major networks at the time. Uh, studi networks were not al allowed to own a piece of the shows that the studios made. So the studios fought a fierce competition for writers um, uh, and, and would sell their shows to the network, which would pay a license fee to air them. And the studios would live and die by the one hit out of the 19 failures that they made. But the studios were independent from the networks at that time. About 10 or 11 years ago, there were rules in Washington that got changed, which allowed the networks to own a piece of the programs they put on the air. Um, various people screamed out if they can own the shows that are on their air, then they will only choose shows that, uh, that they own. Um, uh, for the first couple of years after the FinCEN rules were repealed, um, in fact, the networks brought pretty liberally from every studio. But um, things being what they are, uh, the business itself got vertically integrated. Networks decided that they needed to have their own studio to supply the network so that they would own the material their studio made and they would also own the broadcast outlet upon which it was shown. And so what effectively happened was those 50 mom and pop studios that existed when, when I came to town that competed for the writing talent and often paid exorbitantly for it uh, fell, fell away. Um, the studios did, the networks did buy studios or studios bought networks, vice versa. And so what you see now in town is a much more vertically integrated um, uh, business where in general huge conglomerates like GE or Disney own a network, they own a studio, they own, uh, they're starting to buy into web studios, uh, they, they also get cable channels under their domain so that you have a, an enormous corporation that has a big network broadcast network. It has a cable channel or two or three. It has a studio that supplies the network and those cable channels. And what else does it have? And it has a commissary. Um, <laughs> most so most important. <laughs> theme parks, theme parks. Yeah. Although I will disagree, <laughs> just a touch in that uh, while the, you know, while I think a lot of studios went through, and a lot of networks went through a phase where they bought almost exclusively from their um, sister studios. In various, to various degrees, I think that's opened up a little bit it's again. Cyclical, yeah. I think. We have fifty percent. We have to own everything. Nothing works. We can't own anything. Fifty percent of our new product because we'll is, take a bath. Yeah. Right. Back and forth. Well, fifty percent yeah. of our new product is from outside studios. And so. I think the reason it's cyclical so, too is right, that's true. It's costs, yeah. you know, and, and not that we're here to talk about certainly more creative stuff, but if, if a vertically aligned company buys scripts from all of their, their own home studio and only produce their home studio, that means that network is, quote, deficiting all of those projects. A typical show costs, let's say, $10. The studio usually pays about six and a half of that, and the network, I mean, the network pays about six and a half in that, of that, and the studio pays the other three and a half. If all of the shows are being produced by the same studio for the same network, that three and a half dollars that the studio eats if it's all owned by the same place, they're all eating all of the money. But if you're at ABC with Warner Brothers, for example, and ABC's only paying six and a half dollars of the ten, this is complicated, I'm sorry, 
But I'm lost, by the way. I've no idea. Bottom line is, it, it took me a few We're all lost. We're all lost. They, they, you sometimes need outside suppliers to defray costs. Because if you don't have those outside, it's they all the, the network and seal take all the risks. I'm, I'm sure that is true. To simplify, but it, to simplify some of the stuff that they're saying, for example, there's a script right now that I'm dying to work on, and I would love, it's a project that Mr. Corman here, his client, uh, wrote. And w what we're trying to do right now, before we can even start working on it, the studio that it's yeah, set up at has to figure out if there, are, how they can make that budget work for the numbers that we offer. So it's that Which simple. Which is difficult. <laughs> at the same time, that studio has to see internationally how much that show is worth internationally to see where they get the deficit. A lot. <laughs> no negotiations at the table. A lot. Not having much anymore. But anyway, so, so it's just a I would, matter. Of I would still say that the like ninety percent of the time, though, or ninety five percent of the time, it's the best creative wins, no matter where yes. you are and yes. what you're doing. The I best creative that. wins. Well, 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 Their good. perspective is very <laughs> legitimate, given that so they are creative. the buyers. Yeah. Yes. Well, I just, for me, it's just, again, I come back to the concept. I come back to the concept and the execution of the product, really, as Josh says. I mean, that's what I look for off the bat. That's it. Something clean, something simple, something that I know and I believe can last 100 episodes, that I can go in and say, here is where the series is going to go from episode one, the pilot, and here's where it'll be in episode 100. That, for me, is really the cleanest, simplest way that I can explain it to you. Now, whether people can execute or not, that's, that's what development is all about. You see if there really is something there in character, in tone, in saying something different and contemporary, and at the same time that's relatable. Those are the kinds of things that I... How easy I, it is to work with someone. Yes, <laughs> that, and that too, but... I think that for me is is the starting point. And I think by that, I think it's the same starting point for all of us. When a client comes in, at least to an agent, and pitches an idea, because we too hear a, a bunch of ideas, and every once in a while you hear something, you're like, yeah, there's something to that idea, and you get excited about it, and it resonates, and the first thing you do is you start making your phone calls, and you get the town a little bit excited about it, and sure enough, not al not always, but because you hear so many, you just it just it just feels like it's going to work, and when it goes out, inevitably, the same response. Um, there was a project last year that got on the year this year called Traveler at ABC, and I just remember when we heard that pitch, it, we were all like, wow, and I actually called Chris to hear the pitch, and he too was like, wow, and everybody in town was like, wow, and ultimately, you guys bought it. It, it, it got on the air just recently, but there was just something about that pitch when you heard it, you, you hadn't necessarily heard something like that before. Um, the one thing, though, that seems to be sort of resonating with all of us is when, when you had mentioned the an ABC type of procedural is is being very careful about serialized shows now. The more serialized a show is, the, the, the scarier it is for everybody because if you start to have a little bit of viewer erosion, um, the viewers, it's very difficult to get the viewers back. If you watch Law and & Order and you miss an episode, you can turn on three weeks later and it doesn't matter. If you watch Lost and you're a huge fan of Lost, if you missed two or three episodes, it's very difficult to get back into that show. However, it works very well on cable yeah. because we do limited orders. We do 13 episodes, and the viewers are incredibly loyal, and they will watch straight through. They'll watch every episode, and we don't have to re rely on repeats the way you do. So mm -hmm. it's actually it actually works very well for us where it's sort of difficult for our broadcast. But it seems like this is a system that is, is pretty firmly set in place. There's a timetable for it. We begin to sell in July, sell through September. People write their scripts September, October, November, turn them in in December. Uh, for the, the network model. The, for the network model. Networks then uh, make their judgments about what to pick up to pilot uh, in early January. Uh, say out of what, Josh, 70 scripts you guys develop? That's about right. About 70 scripts. On the one-hour side. On the one-hour side, right. Uh, and uh, about 10 of them will get picked up to pilot, would you say? Uh, this year it was uh, 14, 13. 13, 14. Uh, and then out of those... Um, That's including the Grey spinoff, which wasn't really a pilot. Right, right. And out of those 13, 14, you guys will pick up everyone but mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll pick up uh, about... <laughs> um, oh you'll pick up God. like six or seven. You'll pick up six or seven, right. Except. Um, <laughs> but, but what we're hearing, though, is that the, the, this is a, uh, a system that really intertwines the networks and the studios and the agencies firmly. So that if, if you are not represented out there as a writer by an agent, uh, it's very difficult to crack into the development process. Is that correct? 
or, or I guess the question is better put, what chance does a spec script have to make it in the marketplace as a television well, we have show? Four out of three out of the four series I have on the air were spec scripts, but they are not unrepresented unrepre spec scripts. Right. In other words, they, those are. I don't think any of us can read anything that's unrepresented. Right. Legally. And even legally, we, can't, we have to get a release to read unsolicited material. I can't see. can't read them. Can't hear pitches from them. Right. It's you know. So in other words, the representation acts as a form of regulation of the business so that you guys don't, you know, get somebody telling you in a Starbucks an idea and then for some reason it shows up on the so air and then you guys are liable, yeah. et cetera. It protects because the writers act ultimately, I think. Because it's, there's, there's this strange thing that happens, which is this sort of uh, like collective group think where you can, there'll be a year where you'll hear literally the strangest idea and you'll hear it like four times. It's, mm -hmm. it's just part of, we, <laughs> uh, our culture thinks with this collective you know, <laughs> thing that just, it's amazing. I'll like literally hear like, you know, f four pitches over the course of a week about, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a base on the far side of the moon, you know, and you're like, really? Well, it's four like a, on the same week? <laughs> it's like a year that two years ago or three years ago, awesome. Supernatural came out, Threshold came out, Fathom came out, and uh, invasion. an Invasion came out. Yeah. Four Supernatural shows in the same year. And, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, nobody at the network said, we want a Supernatural show this year. No, but that was the year after Lost. Yeah. That was the year but, after Lost. Mm -hmm. right. And we did it. But it was, was interesting that like the networks actually launched three shows that year about uh, aliens coming from the water. Yeah. Like, at its core. Invasion. Invasion, Invasion Fathom. Yeah. And, uh, and if you would have said, if I got an idea for aliens coming out of the water, to me, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> In LA and LA. Yeah, exactly. Well, what LA. kind of water? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bottled water. water. Crystal geyser. Water. Salt water. <laughs> That'd be on from France. I mean, <laughs> water from you want France. To, what's also funny is that there. It seems to me that there are all these filters along the way. Uh, as a writer producer who happens to be based at ABC Television Studios, <laughs> I hear about a hundred or hundred fifty pitches from writers, and what what happens is w my partner and I will generally hear one or two out of those that sound like they have promise. And what what that means is, you know, if you look at the television landscape. There, I've been told there are only four types of shows, cop, doctor, lawyer, and family. Family being any group of people who interact in some kind of familial way. situation, <laughs> even if they're not blood related. And, uh, and if you look at the top 20 one hour shows, I can't speak to comedy, but you'll find that, that there is a certain truism to that. And we live in a postmodern time where, where we've all seen every show that's ever existed. And it becomes harder and harder every year to come up with something that has the, some of the qualities that television requires, which is, at least in some cases, a, a closed-ended storylines, characters who are in some way heroic. I mean, for instance, on Grey's Anatomy, the characters are, uh, are it's really about the uh, personal relationships and lives of the characters, but, but the fact that they're doctors gives you closed-end cases. You can resolve an issue each week and also uh, by nature of their profession, just makes the doctors sort of likable. I actually likeable. think Grey's Anatomy is a great story about how that got on the air. I mean, you want to talk about that one? That's sure. Uh, Grey's Anatomy actually started with uh, um, similar characters that as war correspondents. Um, and Shonda, when I was at the studio, um, me and Suzanne Patmore, um, developed a script with Shonda where it had these four amazing women that were war correspondents and we loved this script. And we took it to network and we were like, this is our favorite script we've ever done. And they looked at us like we were crazy. Uh, they were like, they're war correspondents. We didn't get those about war correspondents. And it was actually, it was right after like, uh, um, Wars war. Yeah, Peter Noah's script right thing. after. Peter yeah. Noah's war correspondent script. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> so that so that died. But yeah. we went back to Shonda and we said, something. okay, well, let's put this in a more network friendly environment. You know, take some of those attributes of those <laughs> characters and. Uh, and I said, how about cops? And she said, I hate cops. And I said, and then she said, but I like doctors. And we're like, okay, let's do doctors. And, uh, <laughs> and a hit television show comes out of it. It works and, out. And she came thing. up with these great new characters. And uh, over the course of uh, the next year and a half, we developed that. And it was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was no one's favorite script except for me. and. Suzanne, we loved this script. We like cornered Susan Line, then president of the network, like in a, I think it was one of those terrible like TCA events, and we were like, you have to make this script. And then they did, and it was the last pickup. Um, it was scheduled for mid-season. 
Um, so it was under the radar. Um, we worked. At, we had just launched Desperate Housewives, and so we worked hard to make the Grey's Anatomy tone fit, um, feel like it would fit after Desperate Housewives. Um, we launched it. It worked. Well, and I'll it. tell you, from an, from an outsider looking in, from the agent's perspective, that show in the community was all but dead. They had written it off. That's how it felt. Yeah. You know, people talking about it. We had directors working on the show, and they would come back after and say, you know, no one's really paying attention. These guys were paying much closer attention than everybody knew. And, and, and we all felt like, well, that's not going to work. They're going to launch that, and it's going to be done after three episodes. Biggest hit on television. And it's interesting, because at the time, I was at, at the cable uh, studio at NBC Universal, and I remember somebody bringing it up, been wanting to watch the pilot, and somebody brought it to my desk and said, watch it, and we want your opinion. And I watched it, and I'm like, wow. Who are those men? There's a <laughs> <laughs> I remember telling to a group of lonely male executives, I said, wow, I think this is going to be huge. And they looked at me, and literally the seven of them laughed. <laughs> like, it's not going to work. What, what are you talking about? I mean, what do you see in it? I'm like, look at the guys. Come on, there's sex. <laughs> Hello, I'm having sex with three guys at once. I love it. And I call that science fiction for women. <laughs> yeah, that's science fiction. Thank you very much. And I remember, and then the show premiered, and it premiered to the numbers that it did, and I remember walking into the same room of men, and I've learned to just not say anything in the face, and I walk in, and they're like, you see, we told you. That was amazing. They literally forgot the conversation that I had had several weeks prior, that it was not going to work. You know, so it's always... It, it just, you never know. I mean, Chris is a show, Steve, I want to talk about Chris, that's a show that was sort of like, everyone knew it was going to work, it did work, I mean... Yeah, um... We were very excited to have the opportunity to read that script. Everybody uh, hates Chris. Yeah, What's everybody hates Chris. Chris. Um, it was uh, it was Fox. developed at uh, 20th Century Fox for the Fox Network, and it was actually given to us as a spec sample for Ali Leroy, oh, really? who was the writer. And they said, you know, we want you to kind of think about this writer for staffing for the upcoming season, and you know, take a read whenever you can. So uh, we read it, and <coughs> we thought, wow, this is pretty spectacular. I mean, there's something that viscerally happens when you read a great script. Mm -hmm. There is an emotional connection um, when, when it's something that is authentic and true. And so we felt that and we kind of gave it to my boss, Kim Flair, and I gave it to uh, the head of the network, Don Ostroff. And she was like, this is tremendous. I mean, everyone had a really um, emotional reaction to it. And it was still at 20th Century Fox, and we enlisted Endeavor's help um, in uh, getting it out of there so that we could actually um, physically produce it and that Fox wouldn't um, own it anymore. And they were gracious <laughs> enough to let it go. And, uh, and we had, you know, one of the, one of the seven series of comedy for our network. So... You know, and it's interesting, you hear all these stories about it. Uh, for me listening, it, there's so many spec scripts ta being talked about and being developed from one place and ending up in another. And I, you know, I said at the very beginning, it doesn't happen that often. I guess it does happen. Desperate Housewives, yeah, yeah. Was, wasn't that a script it that Mark wrote? It happens a lot and more, actually, yeah. in recent So that's the, only one, that's the only one we've ever had that was a success, was Desperate. And Desperate Housewives, that's, it's interesting. You look at that script, success. and Brand that was, network. A, and that was yeah. initially developed for Warner Brothers. And there were some business issues that got in the way, and it ultimately ended up at touchdown. But y you never know what's going to happen, especially on the business side of things. Because of a vertically aligned world in which we live today, it really, really affects the ultimate outcome of how pro product gets made. Because, I mean, that was developed as a spec script, Warner Brothers to last minute, and then the deal couldn't be made. This past season, we, we, um, there was a spec script that was sent to us by a comedy writer. And it was about... Uh, uh, world-renowned neurologist that gets diagnosed with being bipolar in the pilot. And uh, the writer that brought it to us, we read it and we're like, this is our medical show. And we got really, really excited because we you know with Grey's Anatomy in the air and with House, you know, what is a lifetime branded female show? And we were so excited about it, we did a couple re um, revisions on the script and we didn't have a, a close deal with uh, Fox 21, which is the studio that was going to be doing it for us. We closed the deal and that was one of the uh, six pilots that we shot last year. And it's fabulous, and right now it's still in contention to getting picked up, but it was, it was a spec, and it, and it was. And this writer, and in the process that all of you guys are, and you know, trying to get your material read and your material in there, he um, got partnered up with the guys from 24. 
actually you have the guys from 24 producing a show for a lifetime which is fantastic <laughs> but it, it, it just there is those, those possibilities of you know being a, a, a voice that's you know untraditional in the drama world or vice versa if you go to comedy it's about finding those relationships that will help you spearhead the passion that you have as a writer and yeah. everybody has a possibility of doing that you just have to really find your inner voice and trust what you're doing so when you know all of us at this table get to read those that spec material like you just said about every everybody hates Chris there's such a unique perspective to it and it's so different and it's such a breath of fresh air that people go wow you know this is who this person is and that's where the ball really really starts rolling so a couple you, things I'm hearing is that these pilots first of all have to be I guess the word for it would be loud they have to stand out to you guys in some way from the dozens or hundreds of others perhaps that you 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 see in here I remember speaking to an NBC executive and I said to him Chris how many pitches do you hear in a given development season uh, and he said I hear about 450 and uh, he said it's back to back day after day pretty much from July <coughs> through late September and uh, he said what was demoralizing about it was uh, just something that maybe you said about the zeitgeist. It, you, you, he said, I'll hear my third pitch about like a, guy, a group of guys who are warlocks. And <laughs> the writers will have worked for weeks and weeks on developing the pitch. They're very excited about it. But this is the third time I've heard a version of it. So I'm trying to look at them excited about the warlock show. And then they'll get to the end of the third act and they'll say, and then it turns out that actually she's a vampire and you'll have actually heard that surprise beat in to the two other pitches as well so you know, it's a very difficult process for the executives to go through but what Part you of this what Steve was saying I'm sorry to interrupt because it's like you can hear that fourth <coughs> pitch about the warlocks but but that individual's mm -hmm. point of view on what happens mm -hmm. in that story whatever right. the unique experience they're bringing to it is what all of a sudden just Makes brings you go, wow, for you. that's yeah. a show. It's like the authenticity of the person that's writing it, of their sure. personal experience that sheds light on it, that makes all the difference. And okay, from an, a from an agent's perspective, so you know, I, you know if you're looking um, for representation, it, and I think you would agree with this, it's, it, we, we feel exactly the same way. Sometimes you read a piece of material and you're like, you know, I, I don't know what it is about this piece of material, but it just, I want to read it again, yeah. you know, and it stays with mm -hmm. me. There are certain scripts you read, I remember a couple specifically that I've read a, as many as, four or five years ago that I still think about now. And that doesn't happen that often, but when it does, you just know that you're like. How often does that happen for you? Like not often. Twice a year maybe? Yeah, so, and, but when it does, you just know it's happening. And, and I can't tell you quite honestly why I like something. I could just tell you if I do. And it translates. When you go into a room with somebody and they're pitching that idea, you know who this person is as a writer. You know that they can deliver, quote, the goods. And it really makes a difference. Well, what's interesting to me, approaching it from a writer-producer point of view, is that I can always tell at the beginning of the development season, um, you, you'll, you'll go in and pitch your shows, you'll hear about other writers who have gone into pitch, and you guys would have to tell me whether this is true or not, um, th that almost from the beginning of the pitch phase, you can sense the network's excitement about a handful of projects, like, like the ones that were pitched uh, to, to ABC this year, you know, three or four of the ones that I recall hearing, either because I was in the room or in, in certain cases just heard the scuttlebutt around the hallways. You know, there were three or four projects re almost right after they were pitched that seemed to have a head of steam on them. And, and lo and behold, a number, you know, high percentage of those projects that had a lot of initial heat right off the pitch ended up actually making it onto the schedule. So that's very true, actually. It's, you know, because yeah. you leave that pitch and you, you know, it's a writer you love, it's an idea that fits your brand, it's an idea that's new and not on the air, and, you know, and you can see how, you know, how your marketing department is going to market it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You come so, out of those pitches jazzed. Right. And Again, there's only you know out of the seventy scripts we buy, there's only ten, you know ten, ten of those, those right here yeah. where you're like, if we get this right, this could be monster. Well, there's Sorry. a sh there's a show coming out on ABC now that it's called Pushing Daisies, and I, I'm sort of tangentially involved in the project. And I just remember when we heard the pitch initially, you hadn't really heard anything like it before. And you'll see it's coming out in the fall Wednesdays at eight. Um, but, Watch it. Um, but you hadn't really seen anything like it, bef I mean, heard anything like it before, and I just remember when the process started, you can talk about that process, I mean, yeah. it was just from the very beginning. It was great, I mean, Brian, Brian Fuller came in with uh, uh, producers Jinx Cohen, and he just had such a clear 
vision of what the show was going to be, and that was wonderful. That's, you know all his prior work and it, that he can deliver. Yeah, but it's, it's great when someone comes in with just the, the, this huge matrix of what, of what their world is, of what the show is, down to the little details. When, when, you know, even when, the, and then when that, you know, the outline came in, like it was all about narrow, for that one, it was all about narrowing all of these ideas. We need people who can execute that. So, so development is really incredibly hard. Getting something, getting a script bought is incredibly tough to sell that. You know, we hear 450 pitches and pick up 20. It's, it's so, it's a, it's a numbers game. And once you even get that bought, then you're going to go through the process of getting a story approved and actually writing a script and then hearing notes from the studio and notes from the network. So it's a process and you have to have the ability to actually make changes and be excited about them and process them, not to the letter of what the network or the studio or the non-writing executive producers or even your executive producers are telling you. You can't just do it word for word. No, you, <laughs> you have, have to address to the spirit own. of the note. And you have make to, it your own. yes, you, and you have to make it your own. And again, that takes craft. So well, I don't let's, know. Let's I, talk a little bit about that frenzied process because there's, there's July through September where you guys are hearing uh, on order of eight to 10 pitches a day. You're getting excited about a couple of things, some things you're buying because you're on faith, you're taking it on faith that the writer can deliver, they've delivered it to you before. Some pitches you're buying because maybe somebody above you just, you know, has a no anchor in for that type of thing. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so now they're all sold, your slots are filled up. Uh, the writers now do what? They craft an outline. Yeah. They, uh, the we approve story. Well, they come in and we, pitch the story yeah, before they exactly. craft the outline. They come in and repitch the pilot story. Right. Okay. Right. Well, because so, usually pitches, we we tried. We hope that actually the the pitch itself is more about um, the world, the the series as a whole, um, how it gets to a hundred episodes, and less. Of, we're, we care much less about the, the, pilot, the pilot story. story. It's just one episode. It's, it's in the original. Yeah. Pitch, I yeah. mean, unless unless it's unless the the pilot is so about yeah, about setting up the world it's about setting up the premise um but still I'd, I'd say you know the best pitches we hear are spend you know five minutes on the pilot story and the rest of the time setting up the world setting up how this is a series telling us about these characters and why this show is unique um, okay so the initial pitch is more broad based it's right. about what yes. the series would be as a whole why it's promotable who the characters are etc then once then you guys have gotten excited and you've bought it you are the writer is then called back in to pitch a more elaborated, pi specific pilot story for and what they're going to write. He or she's worked with their studio or their producer right. to get that. Mm -hmm. So during this process, the studio, uh, in other words, when you're going in to sell to the network, you, you have allied yourself with the studio. So, so, so your, your first step is to get represented by a, an agency. Uh, that agency will then... I'm sorry, just in the, uh, the broadcasters, that might be the case. We, we have a bulk of our development that's just... We, the, the agents will send us the writers will buy right. something without, that, a without laying it up to a yeah, studio, studio, mm -hmm. studio until later yeah. on in the process <coughs> at times even we've gone to script that we're ready to do and that that's when we start finding this the and, and some and some of them you know at showtime for example that they, they sometimes never have a studio they yeah. service both the studio and the outlet uh, tutors brotherhood for the most part it's showtime and showtime alone okay or, uh, well, when I hear all this like business stuff that goes in one ear and out the other so the simple way to do it is the, the simple way to think of it is that <laughs> The studio. Less notes. Take it to <laughs> Salty and Brancato. The, stu yeah. the studio is uh, is your creative partner as a writer and the banker of the series. They're putting up the money for it. Now there was a little talk before about deficits. The fact of the matter is the <laughs> network licenses two runs of your show for X amount of dollars. That covers about sixty five percent of what the studio pays to make the whole show. So why would any company be in business where they lose 35% on every episode they do? Well, they don't. Uh, shows that don't work, they lose all the money. There's no return. However, shows that are big hits have all sorts of ancillary uh, money streams, which are, which are to say the studios sell the shows in foreign markets. They sell them on DVDs. They rerun them on cable. So <clears throat> while on the first run of a show on the network, they're losing money to show it just on the network. If they make enough episodes, then there are all sorts of ancillary money streams that make up for the deficit 
and put them into big profit if the show's very successful. So I'm, I'm not sure if that was any clearer, but <clears throat> in any case, so in some cases you're going in with an idea that doesn't have a studio attached to it. In other cases, uh, 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 you, you are allied with a studio and you go in, network buys it, okay, now you've gotten your story for your pilot approved as a writer, what happens now? Well, we do a lot of work there. We can't really just go by that really quickly. I, I like to try to gloss over that part myself. <laughs> because exactly, you're right. That's why you don't want it. But that's I, for us. It's, everything starts with a good foundation, and so a lot of times uh, we like to see it on paper. We actually um, because it it's harder when you're hearing something to really be able to digest it and be thoughtful. And, and give thoughtful feedback. Also, so, when you're hearing quantity of stuff, it's just good to have right. something written down. Tantrum. And, 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 and you can think about it, because you're not, like if you're forced to say something on the spot, it's not it's not really that interesting or that helpful or that productive or for me. And so a lot of times we will make people go back and, and rethink that story, because that for us is the bulk of the work. The script, that, that ideally is the place where you're just going to be making tweaks and adjustments and changes, but the story, right. It's really where you're, you're going to be doing the, the bulk of your kind of creative, I think, work. Some of the pilots that I'm working on, we've sent, uh, we've gone a couple outlines and worked with the writers and the producers on the outline, but then send them back to revise that given outline just to make sure that we're all walking in the same direction and that they're hearing what we need very, very clearly. Right. It's a lot harder, as Vaisal is saying, to send to ha try to fix all those problems in script once the script is delivered, because then you have the structure, you have everything in right. it. Right. So. <laughs> and so I would imagine you encounter all sorts of reactions to the notes you give. There's some writers who work very collaboratively with you guys as a group. There are other writers who are reluctant to make changes. I mean, h how do you guys deal with that process? I'd say usually they're nice to your face and then they leave yeah. you and they go, no, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's very rarely unpleasant in the actual room. It is. Yes, Josh, you are right about that. Yeah. It's, it's, no, no, but it's fascinating because it's, uh, you know, having, you know, the blessing that I've worked with many different creative teams at the networks and studios. It is always fascinating to see, you know, usually, you know, uh, the senior vice president of my department, uh, you know, she is generally the voice on when we're giving notes, but we're all very collaborative. We all talk about the material. In my company, it's not that it's only one person that's on the project, but you will hear several voices. We make sure that we discuss the project thoroughly, and we have internal meetings before we get on the phone with the writers, so it won't seem like a schizophrenic phone call. So that's right, so the, the writers get one they get kind one of They get one direction, focused. one vision, mm -hmm. and then and a lot of the times, it's really interesting because you have the people that, everybody's got a personality, and everybody's allowed to be who they are, and a lot of the times, you know, my uh, thing with the writers has been, you know, the phone call is for you to listen to what the network is saying. We're very open after you've assessed the notes, after you've gone through them, to call us back, have questions, clarify. And a lot of the times those phone calls become these little wars, even though, because the writer is just very much so, mm. and I'm not saying it's not good, but very much so holding on very, very tightly to an idea that they had or something that they've already put on the page, and they don't want to let go of it. And part and of it is, I mean, just some... Oh, I think it's really important for you guys to know this. It's like we are so rooting for it to work. Right. I mean, we are yes. so invested right. emotionally at that point. We are so in love with the story <laughs> we've been told. Like, yeah. No, no, no. I, no, I, 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 I was, what was running through my head was the fact that <clears throat> I hear people complain, writers in particular will complain about executives. And when I think back over the course of my career, having, having dealt with you know, dozens if not hundreds of creative interactions with executives, what, what I'm actually surprised at is how, how smart they are. And I'm not just saying that, Josh, because I work for you. Um, uh, <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I really think it's dedicated, smart people who, you, there, there are one or two just incompetence in the bunch of out, of the, out of 15, 16 years of doing this that were just, they just didn't deserve to have the job. But, but by and large, I, I find the people to be extremely intelligent. Right. They're, they're very, very knowledgeable about uh, not only the shows that they develop for their network. They're, in other words, they're familiar with what their network requires, because uh, each of these networks has a separate brand. But, but also, they're, they're, they're smart creatively. They've done this for years. They've given these notes for years. They can talk the talk. But also, uh, because at the same time, by the time it gets to us at the network, I mean, the agents were probably the first ones to read it before they even gave it. Yeah. You know, the, the, sometimes the writers will show it to their agents before it even goes to the studio. I mean, everybody's got a different relationship. By the time it gets to us, it's been 
through the ringer. I mean, they've given notes, producers have seen it, you know, the agents have said something, the studio has probably seen it. So by the time it gets to us, the advantage is we are looking at a fresh piece of material. I mean, we know the story, we've approved characters, we've done a lot of stuff, but we're literally looking at the script for the first time. And it's basically you're getting a very fresh pair of eyes okay. on material. And we're the ones that are going to, at the end, our team say, you know, this is the reason why they should go on the air. Right. I, I well, that's an important thing, too, which is that you're, you're internally, as you work with these executives, you're hoping that you're building, uh, the, particularly the executive on your project, you're building them into the biggest fan in the world. Because at a certain point, your script, you're going to be gone from the process. In other words, the, the company's going to decide what shows are they picking up for pilot, what pilots are they picking up to series? And for instance, uh, again, I work with Josh a lot. You know, uh, I'm always discussing with him and, and ho ho hoping that he's walking into the rooms that I'm not a part of on the network side and arguing strenuously for the merits of whatever show I'm doing with him. And I think you know, each one of these executives is going to have their chosen favorite, the, the, the ones that they just think are most likely to succeed. And remember, those shows succeeding are good for their careers because they're the, they're the ones who shepherd them. I was going to say, you have to remember in a macro sense that even though it feels sometimes like people are in adversarial positions, mm -hmm. They are not. Yeah. Everyone from the network president to the baby writer has the same goal, which is to get a television show which is a hit on the air, mm -hmm. exactly. which is why we work closely with UTA. We work closely with other writers. We lobby and work with the studio executives and because everybody wants that to happen. And I think it's really important, um, <laughs> since Lisa and I sort of play the middle person quite often between the studios and the networks and the clients, it's, what Steve said is so true. It's called, so called making it your own. When you get these notes, it's not just about, from my perspective, the notes on that specific thing. It's about being able to handle yourself in that notes process, being able to listen, acknowledge, try to give everybody what they want, but don't lose yourself or your voice within that. Because I think sometimes when you give them, quote, exactly what they want, and it just reads verbatim as to what they it blends, gave you, it, 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 and like what it. happens is, why would I want to be in business with somebody for a hundred episodes if I'm going to be, as an executive, the person writing the show? That doesn't work. The best writers well, address the spirit yeah, of the narrative right. yeah, and I mean, where it's coming from and understanding why something is being said. If you, if you approach right. calls and conversations from, I really want to understand what this person is right. saying, I want to understand where it's coming from, then I think you can, you can better kind of accomplish these notes, and I and I, I don't think I can stress enough to you that it's also about relationship building. Yep. This project may not go forward, but you know, we as executives, there are people that I'm like, I don't want to work with them again. I don't. I just I don't. It wasn't a good experience. <laughs> it wasn't fun. Mark's gonna call me and pitch it, and I'm gonna say no. I don't want to hear from them. You know. So you have to also think. I mean, candidly, you have it's, to think. It's, it's about personality and relationships. Steve, that's that's exactly right. And I, I was gonna toss out a tip that somebody told me very early. It's a it's a trade secret I shouldn't be revealing in front of these people. But um, uh, the philosophy that somebody expressed to me is I, I listen to the notes given on the first, when somebody reads the first draft of my script, I listen and I never object to any note. If a note is just automatically great, if they say something so smart and you know right away you've got to do that in your script, you say that's fantastic. You know, you, 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 but, but if you hear any other note, I always just say, oh great, let me think about that. Because if you try to attack it in the moment, you're, you're, you're going to make somebody, you know, th they're throwing out their creative ideas. They've spent five hours reading and studying how to make your script better. And then what, you're just jumping down their throat about some well, And they may have a legitimate insight, you know, that, that you have to get to the spirit of the note. Yeah. I because think... they may not have it articulated it in a language or way that you understand, mm -hmm. but there's something legitimate coming from 90% of the people that's coming from an emotional place yep. that's legit. And from my side of things, I can't, there's not a better phone call in the world to get from an agent's perspective when you hear a, a network executive call you and say, you know what, wow. We've had a couple of those conversations this year where they got a script in it. They're like, wow, it's a new script. That person not only listened, but they really made it their own and they gave us what they wanted in a way that we couldn't do it because that's the, this writer's specific project. And that's what makes people want to be in business in the long term with a writer. To make it better, not to make it different. We're not looking to make it different and put our 
thumbprint on something, we want to make it better. That is our goal collectively For sure. as a group. And at the end of the day, it is a creative process because it comes from the idea that you guys come up with, that you will pitch to a writer like Chris, that Chris will pitch to somebody like, you know, Josh, myself, anybody, you know, any other, other network executives. And then we, once it gets to that point, we have to do the sales process. So it, it is a creative process, but it's a constant sales process. Well, that, you know, the minute it gets to me, I have to make sure, you know, my boss and I work together to step with our other colleagues in the team, and then we have to take it to the president of entertainment. Then that person has to take it, you know, to the head of the company. And eventually we want to do something. In our case, because we have a dual board, we're owned by two companies, the head of the company has to present it to them. So the process is not over until you know there's a director and there's an actor and we're filming. Well, I'm curious. I'm curious about this. So, so, so now the 70 writers <clears throat> at a particular network, or maybe less for a cable network, or us, CW, or CW, yeah. Right. In we're not. We you guys do not, about 35. Yeah, we're not so. at 70. Okay, so. <laughs> So you, you, you but, <laughs> we're not at yeah. uh, yeah. 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 seven. Okay, so the, uh, the 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 writers are off working. They've gotten uh, studio and network notes. Remember, you're going to get notes from your studio, your creative and banker partner. I get them partner. from your producer. You'll and get your them from your producer, and, and your you'll network. get them from yeah. So you get a, you'll get a bunch of notes, and so you turn the script around several times, and now it's uh, around Christmas, and you've you've turned in. Or at least this is the network model. Again, cable mm -hmm. operates a little bit more on a year-round basis so whenever you guys read a script you love there can automatically be a discussion immediately about when it'll go on I suppose that's true of the networks too right Josh you can if you some networks more than others were as I said stick pretty much to a lot of times we, we hold free. back not necessarily our, our team is a lot smaller but we will hold back with material in the sense that we're gonna wait to get everything in before we start saying you know before you make a decision before before you you decision to time it so you get a bunch of it in at once to be able to compare basically. right <clears throat> right so, uh, uh, but, but, network, but at the network model, it's ja it's January now, and you guys, you executives, are sitting in your <clears throat> inner sanctums and and deciding what of these seventy scripts are going to be picked up to pilot, be it half hour comedy or one hour drama. Um, what what are the factors? How does it work? At ABC, it's a it's it's actually one of my least favorite times of the year. <laughs> like every, every morning, you you know you suit up in your emotional armor and you like go to the office and you hunker down in your group with you know uh, with the president of the network and and your department and you battle it out for you know sometimes two weeks trying to figure out which pilots to pick up which and ones that you love what, and so what does that look like so 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 steve mcpherson's the head of uh, head of abc he, he's he's read mo he's read the ones that have been kicked upstairs by you guys or he's read the ones oh, he's read all 70 is he you know how to, uh, um, without, without, he, he reads an awful lot, mm -hmm. and then, uh, it, but out of that group, we all pretty much a consensus of the top twenty choices is fairly easy to make, I right. would say. Mm -hmm. And then it's going from, you know, twenty or twenty-five to twelve that takes us two weeks and is battling. Right. Well, would it be fair to say that it, that it twenty to twelve? But you know, there's like three or four that are like everybody agrees they get they're getting right ready. Away. Yeah, they, and they usually get picked up much quicker. Yeah. yeah. Can you give me, in your years of experience, like some extremely dramatic example of, for instance, you stomping on top of a table to get a script picked up? Or does it work that way? Well, I do that every season. Well, you do that every year for my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, how did Betty rarely. Get I was gonna say Ugly Betty. How, I was gonna say how did Ugly, Ugly Betty. Ugly Betty. Get that was a lot of stomping, wasn't it? Oh. Ugly Betty was, uh, you know, was, was another dark horse. It. Uh, it definitely like was not a not a shoe in, mm -hmm. um, and we loved the we loved the script, and then you know later on we loved the pilot, but uh, it tested terribly, terribly. Um, mm -hmm. No one liked it. Everyone hated the title. You know, um, they thought it was so mean, and so it was a <laughs> big fight within the company. It's and, interesting. So. I, I worked in the original telenovela of. of Betty La Fea, and, and it's fascinating because by the time it got to them, I remember when I was again at NBC, NBC Universal, and at the time Universal w had you know the rights to do this project, and they gave it over to Touchstone. Mm. At the time, Touchstone, sorry, NBC Studios. And I remember looking at the head of the company going, I cannot believe you just did that. Not ever knowing that it was gonna be that, that hit, but then, you know, so it's just really amazing the permutations of a, of, of a project can go through. And then we developed it for two years with a couple different writers until Sylvia Horta really got it right, nailed it, and uh, 
Um, but so this was a property. all along. It was just one of those things where you were just fighting every step of the way to get it picked and up. You, and and you get guys it well, that's interesting too. That it was a property that you developed with somebody else. Mm -hmm. They didn't m meet your requirements, and mm -hmm. so then you put a new writer on it for the following development season, yeah. and it worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also, I mean, it's, what's interesting is that you go through such ups and downs in this process. You have the thrill of selling the pitch initially, especially if it's one of your first times doing it. You get the phone call. They want to buy it. They want to buy it. And it's really, really exciting. And then there's a collective sigh of relief. Oh, we're in. And then you get your notes, and it's like, oh, I don't know. They don't like it very much. And then, <laughs> and then you're depressed and disappointed, and we're all depressed at this point. But then you turn a new script, and it's like, yeah, we love it. And everybody's excited and happy. But, by the way, we go through the same, uh, even on the network side, we go yeah. through the same thing. Everyone like, we're, I don't think we're supposed to. Like, I always heard, like, like, when I switched over from the student network, you're not supposed to be emotionally involved. You can't there's help no, it. There's you, no love, you love the people you're working with. You're friends with the writers. You want them to succeed. And so it's just it's a constant and, roller coaster. And then in December, when, there's pick, when they're picking those pilots up and it's down to 20 most of us kind of know what the 20 are um, and you're not supposed to know but you kind of know and you're riding this train it's like chick, 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 and they start picking stuff up and you know that there's only a certain amount of slots left and, and <laughs> projects are falling off and you're just staying on the train you're like please dear god pick it up and and then you get the phone call that it's picked up and you're so excited you're so excited but then you have to get you can't, a director you can't, well you can't find a director <laughs> and you're like oh my god we're out. We're not finding a director. Everybody goes through this. Everybody. Or you're With not getting a director right. fast enough right. for the right then you director. you finally get your director, and then you need a 40-year-old guy. You yeah. need a 40-year-old or a 35-year-old guy to play the lead. And there are two in here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, we'll, we'll, dis we'll discuss more about the uh, 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 that aspect of casting and putting directors on pilots, uh, I guess, in the next panel. I want to open up the floor to a few questions here. I want to ask you guys just one final question before we get into questions from the audience, which is this. Um, you've all been around a while. You know, how is this business changing? We, we've, we, I alluded at the beginning of the conversation to the fact that we are a vertically integrated business. The business, in my opinion, has tightened. It's a well, little right tougher now it's to break in. It's all about the multi-platform. It's all about how many different platforms can a project be exploited on. Is it something that you feel like can have a, an online component? Is it something that can perhaps can have a franchisable game? Is it something that can play? That can play in so many different platforms. That's what you have to be. Like. That's what we. I, I'm, I hope. I think I'm probably speaking for everyone. That's a huge mm -hmm. part of what we're bombarded mm -hmm. with every day by your boss. Everything you bring in, they're like, okay, what's you know, how does this build out into something bigger? Right. And I think that from the audience perspective, uh, as I said, I had the privilege of being out of the business for four and a half years and just sat back and didn't read a script. And, um, and, and it's just really interesting because as, a, as an audience member now, especially with a, you know, this, the, the whole new generation coming up, there's no differentiation between broadcast and cable at one point. They know where to find the show. Like I said, there's a multi-platform and they go for that. It's creative content and it's what the story it's going to spell out. So it's not really, you know, Univision, for example, is the largest uh, uh, broadcaster for for Hispanics in the United States. And at one point, they're going to have to shift their business model because a lot of people are starting speak Spanish and English at this point, and that demographic is grow growing by leap leaps and bounds, and you're bilingual, and you have the choice of every other network right. that's out there. So and I, from a Pollyannish point of view, I, I think that we're going to have to figure out distribution outlets for sure, how people are going to watch the convergence between television and the internet and DVR, and that's all, the, the business itself is changing, but I think creatively, if you build it, they will come. If you bring something good, people will watch it. Grey's Anatomy, I agree with you. Grey's Anatomy is never going to become a video game, and it's the biggest hit on television. <laughs> I, I agree with you. For for us, and but it is a D, this, it is this a CD. Starts, for sure. No, for sure. I mean, there there, there are other outlets and other. You know, it's number one CD sales. Too. Yeah, it is. But it, but that's not where we start from. We do like, and this starts at Steve McPherson on, on down. Our ethos is um, build your creative for the television and then let the multi-platform structure you know take over as we go so we we do concentrate almost exclusively on developing for you know developing good creative and then it will find its outlets as it mm -hmm. as it goes um so uh, for for me i mean what we what scares the bejesus out of me is all the dvr stuff um and knowing that the paradigm for the television industry is and and there changing. are there are plenty of people talking about how that's going to change and the advertising sales are going to change um, but and there, there's definitely a shift going on right now and I don't think any of us know the answer as to how that shift is going to play itself out but it will it will definitely play itself out and and I think that it, there are far brighter people than I talking about the very same issues there are more people watching television today than in the history of television 
um, and how they're going to watch it, how we're all going to watch it is certainly changing and it'll continue to change, but. It's always changed. Yeah. It's always changed. I mean, you know, <laughs> television started at one point and they didn't know how to program it or what is this newfangled thing and you figure it out. So I think the same thing is happening online and, you know, it takes a little bit of perspective as to what the consumer in a specific distribution platform responds to. Um, but it is an inevitability. It's just All right, let's, let's open up the floor, <coughs> excuse me, for some questions. Um, do, we, do we have a mic that goes around? Yeah, thanks, Shereen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's been so fascinating. I would be interested in having the people who represent um, networks or um, cables to define their brand. Sure. That's an excellent question. Um, he's an agent, so his brand is what? Lying, cheating, and stealing? <laughs> <laughs> it, it used to be. Sure, Chris. Um, now not Whatever, so much stealing, but lying and cheating <laughs> always. Um, we're at ABC. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a uh, strong character, um, uh, some, somewhat female-friendly. Uh, 18 to 49 women tend to drive our audience on all our shows except for Lost, which is split pretty evenly. Um, but our brand is definitely um, somewhat female friendly and uh, strong characters, iconic characters, um, high quality TV, sh high quality writing, um, but poppy and fun. Same demographic as ABC. We're going after women without the exclusion of men, and uh, hopefully soon will not be the, uh, the network known as the Women in Peril, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> more women empowerment, and just sort of, uh, sort of. <laughs> you know, taking a photocopy of what's going on in society and the zeitgeist with females. Uh, we're 18 to 28. Um, <laughs> we represent a generation that's called the millennial generation, also known as gener Generation Y. So we have a lead that's usually late teens to early 20s, uh, pretty evenly split female to male. CW is uh, women 18 to 34. All right. We're all mm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing yes. some parallels here. Well, I think I think what you'll find is men are really hard to program to. I think what we found is that they go to specific shows, events, so sports, well, sports, you know. And our ethos is get the women there, the, they'll bring their the men right. will come. Because yeah. uh, women control the remote and the television. But and Fox, who isn't represented here on this panel today, is generally known for what we would call, I guess, what edgier, testosterone, testosterone 24, most male. Most male. <laughs> well, what's interesting is with the ad, with, with DVR becoming more prolific and more relevant, you'll, I, I think you're going to see more of a blending of what the demographics are watching each network. If you look at what CBS picked up this year yeah. on the drama side, it's not consistent with their typical procedural without a trace. It's more like brand. Fox, which yeah. picked up yeah. stuff that's very CBS. Right. Exactly. Like. So right. I think you know it's it's changing and it'll continue to change. Right. Next question. As you guys develop your ideas, is also always be very informed. What every you know, it's very easy with the internet now to basically know what every network, cable or broadcast is, is sort of doing. You know, you see their brand on the air, and that's the stuff that they're looking for. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's a great panel, so thank you very much. If you are a baby writer and you happen to hit something that a, a, a manager, production company are interested in and they want to take it to the networks and if you know, it does all happen, when can the baby writer expect some sort of money and how much? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to be so crude, no. but you know. <laughs> I think it, it depends. Um, profit? It, de it, de <laughs> yeah, it, de it depends. Never. I think that it, it, it's really dependent upon how you take the idea out. Television is a pitch-driven business, unlike features, which is a spec-driven business. And you can be anybody and take out a pitch so long as you have somebody making phone calls for you to set that pitch up. And if the pitch sort of catches a little bit of fire um, and multiple people want it, you can drive your price up. Um, usually, if you're somebody that hasn't done it before, you're not going to get that much, and it's going to depend on if it's network or cable. But in terms it, of, are you asking specifics? Like, when do you get your first check? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, if, if, they, if you you're involved in the pitch. writing. After, after you sold it, pitch, after you you sold it, there's a, it breaks down 100% yeah. of money, is 10% upon commencement, 20% upon approval of story, 40% upon first draft, 10, 10, 10 for each polish. Mm -hmm. So if you make $100,000 and you're, you, for a script at the network, you will start your process in <laughs> July, and you'll get paid by December 31st, you know, a lot of the money. 
or sixty thousand. And typically, with a baby writer, what what you know, if somebody has a, an absolutely phenomenal idea, <clears throat> the studio will often encourage that writer to be aligned with a much more experienced showrunner or or non-writing producer who understands the ropes, who has the relationships with the network executives, who's been through the the grind before, and that uh, that person or or people will shepherd the baby writer through the process of getting their draft together and done. And the baby writer will probably accept some, uh, they, will, they will not be the showrunner if it goes to series. They will be a, a you know, a, um, a, a co-executive producer, an Supervised important voice, <laughs> um, but somebody who. Um, but you do have some money so you can like live while you're doing the rewrite. Absolutely, yes, right? indeed. 100% okay. yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. You guys have all done a great job of explaining everything. It's very informative. I have what is probably a very dumb question. Um, I'm a TV addict. I work in television. I love it. Um, why are advertisers more afraid of the DVR than they were of the VCR? Because I was fast-forwarding commercials with my VCR just as much as I am now. And I, I just think it's so much easier out, to I just do. Wonder. Easy. Just because it's less clunky. You're one of the few people who can actually yeah. figure out how to do a VCR. <laughs> yeah. All right. I a thought TiVo there was some other some other secret out. thing that about DVRs that maybe we all didn't know that the advertisers Doesn't were afraid of. Doesn't everything use here? Well, it's because it's just all on your <laughs> remote. It's you know, it's, it's I think the technology is advanced. The DVR, how to record. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just okay. it's just a much easier. Process. So it's easier and less clunky. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And DVR penetration, gentlemen, is, gentlemen, the, gentlemen, it's so much, so much it's, higher. It's, right now, it's twelve percent of the. In the last three or four years, it's become twelve to fifteen percent of the entire really? um, population of, of people watching DVR? television. Yeah, it's going to be and twenty by yeah. the end of the year. Yeah, but all the media buyers and all all the agents and writers and the executives have them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone works in television. You but I mean that number is going to that, that that twelve percent is actually staggering. It's a lot, a lot of people, and it's really grown fast. exponentially in the last couple of years, and it's going to continue to grow. But I mean, everyone's talking about how to figure this out. This is a big issue, but it will, you know, it'll get figured out somehow. So we just had our upfronts. Uh, what surprised you about what got picked up? What trends do you see? Not a lot of comedy. As a comedy exec, I'll start there. <laughs> so sad. It's very sad. Um, uh, well, I work a lot in comedy, as do you and you, and I think that it's. I think it's very hard to launch a show. Period. And comedies are particularly difficult, I think. Because it's two in, a, in an hour. So you basically have to launch two shows. Yeah, so they launch you know. slower than dramas. It yeah, takes a long and time you can't to jam. You can't make somebody think something's funny. They have to come mm -hmm. to it and actually, you know, legitimately feel that it's making them laugh. I think when a good comedy is on, it's kind of incumbent upon people who like it to watch it and evangelize it because... It's rare, it's hard to do, it's a very sort of ephemeral thing, but there are, I, I'm Pollyannaish too, while the number of comedies is down, I think the comedies that are on are generally really good, whether it's network or cable. I mean, the middle's gotten cut out. There's not a lot of, you know, okay multi-camera sitcoms. Mm -hmm. I think you're also gonna see a trend um, in the television business becoming more like the f feature business of, quote, opening a show. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you can talk about that because you guys do yeah, it really well. Just respond to that. We had sort of the opposite side of that as I work on drama, and we had on ABC alone seven new dramas, 15 or 16 on the network now, all that have, we've launched in the last three years, which means that we our little department has to produce over 300 hours of television um, and make them really good. great because the bar is high. And so we have 300 hours of TV to produce. But you guys do a really good job of actually launching Shame. a show. I think it's mm -hmm. becoming more like the feature business when you're going to see billboards everywhere. You're going to see a lot of money spent in launching these uh -huh. shows because it's so competitive in the fall that uh, similar to if a show doesn't open, it's gone. And it, mm -hmm. what, it, didn't, it wasn't like that before. And I think that people need to make a splash. If you look at CBS's announcements with Swingtown and Viva Laughlin, those are not the types of shows. Or Twilight with Werewolves and Vampires. Those are not the types of shows CBS typically made, but they're loud, they can make a statement with them, and people will pay attention. Okay, more questions? Sir? Can uh, you guys explain the fascination and the process for getting shows on the air with despicable characters? I mean, if you take 24 or Rescue Me, 
if the building burned down and, you know, burned the cop <laughs> and the firemen, the world would be better off. And it used to be that we had all these Pollyanna characters. And what's the, what's the mindset with the studio executives and the agents and the network people and everything? Because, you know, I'm thinking the next great idea is the Idi Amin show. I mean, you know. Dave, David Milch. Mm -hmm. David Milch changed time. I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the world wouldn't be better if Dennis Leary's character no. were dead. Um, but, but he's, he's messed such up. He's a hero. Yeah, he's an anti hero and he's a human character and it's no, another. No, no, no. uh, Bruce Willis in Die Hard is an anti hero. All right, well, that's a creative discussion. I'm going to say just very yeah. quickly that uh, with the multiplicity of channels, I think there's a, a wide range of shows, the types of which, you know, for instance, you can't put. Dennis Leary, uh, Rescue Me on Vic, ABC. Vic Mackey. Right. You know, in other words, in other words, it, it's right. really entirely dependent on the kind of niche broadcasting we find ourselves in. FX brands itself as a place to see outrageous, complex. quote unquote, unlikable, complex, or I would say, interesting characters. Um, uh, it's also real, though, too. I mean, there are not everyone on this earth is likable and happy right, and right. friendly. There are More evil people out there. <laughs> Hence, Mark Corman, everyone. No, I'm kidding. Claude. Uh, <laughs> I think. I think he's. He, you are despicable person. You're well, in the right place. You go to FX. Uh, yeah. right. You go to Showtime. Or House. House is on FBC. Isn't that character fairly despicable? Right. Louis De Palma. Right, let's take another question. You? <laughs> he is. Ma'am, you? You see? Flawed, but brilliant. Thank you. Using the Ugly Betty uh, show as a model, to what extent are the networks looking for shows in the dramatic and the comedy area that have already had proven successes in the international marketplace? Clearly not as much as I would have liked. <laughs> um, Ouch! Um, at Lifetime, we look at all sorts of source material to do it. I mean, we, we've bought several British formats to be that we're redeveloping for this market, and we did look at the formats of telenovelas, even though the strip novella factor does not work on our air. So it just we do I we think look at books, we look at everything. Positive pre awareness helps you. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I, I know that we uh, as producers we, we we comb. I mean, I was in yeah. Tokyo recently, and I'm trying to find like, oh my God, what's the big Tokyo hit? It, it, you know, you're looking for something. One of the things that's helpful when you go into cell, remember, 450 pitches each one of these people hears. I'm trying to come in there with something that makes them forget the last meeting they had and think about mine through the next meeting they're going to have. And one way to do that is to walk in with something that's a branded hit in some other uh, in some other part of the world, or I come in with the life rights to somebody or a, a book. You never used to have to do that as much in television, but now, once again, it's about cutting through the clutter of so many channels and so Are many different shows. Are you going to do a shows. show for Lifetime this year? Very, I might be seeing you next week. Huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's take two more questions. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. I wonder if we could take a step back, because the seminar is called Breaking Into the Box, and if we could... The, Mark and Lisa can maybe talk about the realities of an unrepresented writer. That's going to be the third panel today, okay. which is which will be covering that in great detail. And how you know how that can how great material will get read, even though you know the catch twenty two that kind of seems yeah. to happen. We'll, we'll 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 spend lots of time on that. Um, you, sir. Yeah. And then you, Miss in front. You're our last question. One of the things I love about the WGA seminars is that it always reaffirms that it's really about a unique voice and the power of story. And you hear out in the world that that's not what it's about. And it's how to navigate all this stuff. And it, here I hear what I want to hear, which is if you have a unique voice and unique vision, there's th that's something attractive to the industry. And I really i am encouraged about that. Um, I have a bunch of friends in the industry who have recently been fired because they're older than 40 and they're in their 50s. And there seems to be some ageism stuff going on in TV that I hear a lot about. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that on the writer side and, and how does one deal uh, you with know, that? Honestly, um, we pair people, young writers, with people who are 40 plus. I, that makes no sense to me. Again, as someone who's looking at this, it's about the craft. And I find people who are who have years and years of experience they're actually better writers you know so that may be what you know truly that may be what's out there but at least from a very personal perspective i really take issue with that i just i do because a good piece of material is a good right. piece of it material it has so much more to do with sensibility than with age i mean and i have a very young demographic but you know, half of our writers are 
40, 50 plus. I mean, you guys, if you see age, is a, if you age. see age as a problem, it will be a problem for you. If yeah. you see your ethnic background as a problem and use that as an excuse, it will be a problem. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think maybe, Hands down. Um, I think right, there's definitely, you know, discrimination in all fields of life and work, but um, I think if you're really good, it yeah, it's sort of irrelevant. It's about quality, yeah. period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, uh, f speaking for myself, the, uh, I see the networks a lot of times looking to when there is a young writer. See, if you're going after a demographic that's, say, 18 to 34, then a lot of times a writer who's 30 years old is going to be tapped into that. But I, I have always found the networks to be um, uh, desirous of having an over 40 experienced hand around as well for a whole number of different reasons. So, and yeah, and again, I think it, it, some of it has to do with if you have consistently delivered for these networks, then it really doesn't, I mean, uh, Waylon Green oh is God. doing Law and Order. He's 106. He's, and, doing, you know, he's, he's real doing good. Canterbury's. We all wish we could be Waylon 70, Green. 73 and he's gonna run Canterbury's Law for FBC. Yeah. There you go. Uh, final question. Uh, thank you for coming today and giving us your time. Uh, my question is about once you uh, have a pilot and you've sent it off, what is the job of an executive then as the series continues? Well, that uh, depends on where uh, on where you're talking about. Uh, at, at ABC, um, I'm a development executive, so you know we shepherd we shepherd the whole process um, all the way through. Usually, um, sort of. You know, through the shooting of the pilot, through the development of the the beginning of the series, all the way through to about halfway through the first year, and then we hand it over to the current department as soon as sort of as soon as the show is up and running and flying by itself. We you know launched out of the nest and and every company I've ever worked at for some reason I start developing the shows and I stay with them through the life of the series. Some places so. are constructed differently where mm -hmm. current and development is together and some places are like ABC where you hand it over. And it's about making sure that the future episodes remain true to what kind of you set up in the pilot but it's still is still an evolution of what you set up in the pilot so it's kind of both things you really kind of want to keep it moving forward but also keep it on the concept that you've constructed in the pilot. But even on shows uh, like in order to develop the Grey's Anatomy spinoff this year, I had to sort of come back on to Grey's Anatomy for a bit to catch up on that show so that we could help, you, you know, develop the spinoff. So you, you stay tangentially involved in any show that you work on. Um, right. Well, first of all, I want to thank this distinguished panel for joining us today. Thank you very much. I think there's some coffee out here for everybody, and uh, we'll start the next one at uh, 12 noon. Thanks a lot. Thank you.